What's up, everybody? And I appreciate you guys joining us for another episode of the J-Boy Show. Uh, really excited to interview former Auburn safety, uh, whip, whatever you want to call it, Rob Pate. Uh, Rob was an All-SEC uh, player as a sophomore, um, just a, a guy that, that Auburn fans know. He's very well known in the community, uh, is a great success story, and is really going to go in-depth and give us some great stories in this interview uh, about back when he played from 97 to 2000. Uh, Rob's a guy, like I said, I mean, he was an All-SEC performer. Uh, he played every year uh, that he was there from freshman to senior. Uh, he totaled 213 tackles, uh, seven interceptions, and had three and a half sacks, 26 pass deflections, two fumble recoveries, and a uh, block. I can't remember if it's a field goal or a punt, but again, a guy that kind of did it all. So at the end of the day, we're super excited to have Rob. Super excited that you guys are joining us. We're growing unbelievably fast, and that's because of y'all. Our guest list is going to keep increasing uh, in you know kind of list status, I guess you could say. Uh, we have Jimmy Dykes from ESPN coming on uh, tomorrow, which is Thursday. Then we have uh, Sonny Smith, the former Auburn basketball coach, coming on Friday. Then there's one that's pretty much confirmed that I think everybody's going to be pretty excited about. But again, you can follow us if it's your first time hearing us or, or whatever. Go to Twitter. We're at the J-Boy Show. Uh, we're on Facebook. Just type in Jake Crane. You can find me there. Uh, we also have a page on Facebook. Uh, we're on YouTube, the J-Boy Show. On Instagram, D-A J-Boy Show. So it's the J-Boy Show. Really appreciate you guys. There's a reason we're number one on Apple Sports Podcasts and Sporting News. And we're going to continue to try and come for the other number one spots. All right, guys. This is J-Boy. Let's get it. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for joining us uh, for another episode of the J-Boy Show. We're super excited to have another former Auburn football player here, a guy that, you know, a lot of people in the Auburn community know and, and a guy that's done a lot and, and been a really good success story. And, and that's Rob Pate. Rob, I appreciate you joining us, man. How's it going? I'm doing great, Jake. Hope you're doing well. Yeah, doing really well, man. Doing really well. And, and you know, I really want to kind of uh, kind of jump in it here. Um, you know, when you're playing days at Auburn, the first thing that I kind of see, especially when I was, you know, doing the pre-show, kind of doing a little research was just, you know, the amount of games that you played in, you know, and it's very rare nowadays to see somebody, you know, uh, through the span of their career contribute in as many games as you did. Can you just kind of talk about kind of being a guy that came in and just had to play? Well, you know, yeah, that was really just because of the, the situation that Auburn was in from a uh, defensive back standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, we were limited in numbers when Coach Oliver came in, and, and he told me when he was recruiting me that, uh, hey, you know, I'm signing you because I believe that you're going to have to play early. And, and it wasn't just me. It was it was guys like Larry Kasher, uh, mm -hmm. Herman Banks came in, and he was a receiver that converted to corner, and he played. Um, so uh, there, were, there were several of us that had to step in and, and you know, really – get our feet wet, uh, in, in SEC play. But, uh, you know, I, I think that it had a lot to do with the fact that, um, you know, one, we were, we had just gone through the Alabama Mississippi all-star game. And mm -hmm. so back then we, we did that in the summer. And, yeah. uh, you know, I can remember that I, I felt like that the guys that I competed with in that game were a higher caliber player than, than really my signing class was. And so yeah. when we, when we showed up on campus, it was like, man, that was almost even a step down. Uh, from from some of the uh, people that we competed against, so I thought that that was a great springboard into um, into summer training camp, and then it was just about learning defense. You know, it was about learning the calls. It was about being able to line up and get people where they were supposed to be. And um, I mean, you had to be a obviously you had to be athletic to play, but you yeah. had to. I mean, the number one battle was being able to line up and 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 know what you're supposed to do. And, and under a system like Bill Oliver, that was uh, not the easiest task in the world. And yeah. so that, that got me a chance early. Yeah. And uh, can you kind of, Rob, if you don't mind, can you kind of talk about just kind of that feeling of, of, you know, the first game in Jordan Hare, you're a freshman, you know, can you kind of talk about just your feelings, you know, before the game, knowing that you were going to play and knowing that, you know, really your dream had came true. Can you kind of take our audience in that locker room with you before the game, if you don't mind? Well, yeah. Well, first, I would take you back to the to the first game. Um, mm -hmm. So my first game at Auburn was on the road in Charlottesville, Virginia. Okay. Uh, it was the opening uh, game of college football, a Thursday night game. Um, and I not only had obviously it was my first game, I'd never even flown in an airplane. <laughs> and so just the entire experience was just, you know, unbelievable to me. And it was a, a beautiful part of the country. The campus was was so, so nice. And uh <clears throat> And so I, I played about 30 snaps. In fact, the first play that I played was on the goal line. If, if people remember that game, um, they got the ball and, uh, let's see, we got the ball and went backwards and tried to punt out of the end zone, got blocked. They had a, they 
recovered it, or we recovered it. They got a safety. And then when we kicked off, they drove it down inside the five-yard line. Well, I was in the corner um, on our goal line defense. Okay. And so my first play, I run in, and I'm lined up to the uh, uh, to, to the Auburn sideline, and Virginia runs the option right at me. That's my oh, first here we, play. Here we go. Football. Here we go. That's it. And so I take on the fullback, and, and you know, he's – an enormous guy. I'm giving yeah. up, you know, 70 pounds. Did you go knees? And, did you uh, try and chop him or did you no, try and go I, head up I with him? I hit him high. But I love it, me. Rob. He, he You're sort of, crazy. He, sort of, <laughs> <laughs> he hit me into the pitch lane. And so it ended up being an errant pitch. And oh, Brad Ware right. was the was the corner on the opposite side. And he was, uh, you know, tailing the play. He uh-huh. picked up the ball and ran it back about 20 yards. And then we scored a touchdown on the next play. That was my first play ever. Oh, that's so, awesome. Oh, it was unbelievable. But uh, but so the next week, I played about 30 snaps in that in that game. And so the next week was our first game in Auburn. And um, and I and I was the starter. We were playing Ole Miss first SEC game. First time I'd ever played uh, in Jordan hair. And it's just it's just surreal. I mean, you, you think that you're ready for that moment. You sit over there on the practice field, and, and at the end of the practice, you look over and you eyeball Jordan Hare. I mean, it's it's an, the intimidating presence. There wasn't as many buildings on campus, so it stood out. You can mm-hmm. see it from almost everywhere. And, um, you know, your heart would just race a little bit, not only thinking that it's going to be so neat to go in there and play, but, but thinking about all the people that, that helped you get there, yeah. that uh, you were going to be playing for. Um, you know, it was just, it was just unbelievable. And, uh, man, I'll, I'll never forget it. I'm grateful for it. Yeah. And, and again, you know, you, you played, I know you're listed and if you even go back and look at kind of the roster when you're on, you're listed as the whip. Can you kind of explain to our audience, was that more of a nickel type safety type kind of exact? Could you do both? Like what was, what was something that made the whip, the whip to you? Yeah. Well, a lot of people don't know that I played four different positions yeah. all four years. Yeah. And so um, after my sophomore year, we transitioned from a three, four defense to a four, three, which was really good for a guy like Marcus Washington. You know, Marcus mm-hmm. went from, from a guy that uh, probably would have gone undrafted as an outside linebacker to a defensive end and a four, three scheme that, that got him picked in the second round. Yeah. It was not a good transition for a guy like me because I went from a, from a safety, that was a, you know, I was a, I was an all SEC safety as a yep. sophomore. And then I now, instead of playing 12 yards deep, I'm on the line of scrimmage. And, and it was more of a, of a hybrid outside linebacker, almost a tweener, um, mm-hmm. kind of a star position in some defenses. Um, and, you know, sometimes I was coming off the edge. Sometimes I was the, the run uh, force uh, to the strong side. And sometimes I was defending um, half the field. Sometimes I was covering man to man on the slot receiver, you know, just kind of depending on what we were doing. Yeah. So it, it let me do a little bit of everything, but I felt like it took away, uh, you know, just the, the savvy and the being a smart football player and playing with your eyes. Now everything was happening behind me. Mm-hmm. And I really felt like, um, you know, for the first time in my life, um, you know, that, that just wasn't a natural position for yeah. me. And, and, and my numbers suffered because of it, but, uh, um, you know, but at the same time, it was, you know, we, we had taken a nosedive as a program in the middle of my time at Auburn. And then we were able to get back to a championship game by the time I left. Yeah. So, uh, and, and the, at the end of it, it was, it was all worth it. Definitely. And, and can you kind of, you know, when I asked, I asked junior Rose green this and, and, you know, coaching the secondary for as long as I did, I always, always like to ask this. What was the coverage that you guys felt the most comfortable in or that you felt the most comfortable in that when you guys had to have it, you know, for Junior and them in 04, it was four checks, which, you know, obviously it's four and then we'll make our trips check and our empty check and all that stuff. What was you guys go to? Well, first of all, let me give you props for interviewing former defensive players. Oh, yeah. And not and and not going for the uh, (laughs) the prima donna quarterbacks. And uh, all these offensive guys that end up getting to sell insurance when they uh, yeah, that's true. When they leave well, Auburn. I am Kurt Crane's son, you know that is that is true. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me and, and, and let me tell you this: the first time I ever went to Auburn was for Terry Bowden's uh, football camp before my junior year. Okay. And the very first thing that I did was I ran a forty-yard dash um, that they timed us on the practice field, and it just so happened they had us in two lines. And when I uh, got up on my uh, on my side, the guy that was running on the other side was T. Martin. No right? way. And so T. Martin was the number one quarterback in the state. He may have been the number one. That's quarterback a tough draw, Rob. That's a tough draw there. Well, 
what 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 it did for me was it had all the eyes of every oh, that's coach true. That's was true. over there to watch. That's true. And so as we go off, I, he wasn't a fast quarterback, and 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 I and I beat him. And, and well, anyways, yeah. as I'm walking back, your dad comes up, <laughs> and he says. He says, damn, son, what's your name? And I said, Rob Pate. He said, he said, you know what you just ran? And I said, what? He said, you ran a 4-4. Four, four. Damn, son, I got my eye on you. Really? So, that's uh, him. That's, that's definitely and him. So he was, he I'm was surprised that's out. as uh, clean as it was. I'm surprised you didn't get a little taste of something else. <laughs> well, I, you know, that, that was a long camp, and so yeah. he was a little more colorful later on. But, mm-hmm. uh, but no, it was. I, that was a great memory. That's great. And, uh, I appreciate you telling me that. I, I that's uh, that's. I, there's some good ones that I still have yet to hear. So I'm ex- always excited <laughs> when I get to hear a new one. But you know, answering your question about the uh, the coverage, we you know probably as a safety, um, you know, I, I liked when we ran a uh, uh, what we called a, a ten, which uh, allowed the, uh, the the run for safety to kind of play center field okay. with any sort of shallow crosser, okay, but still be a run support guy and fit no matter uh, where the run may go. So there was a lot of freedom that you could drop in. It, it looked like a cover two. We disguised it as a okay. two, which you always did. Yep. And then that uh, that that four safety would then slide down into the middle of the box, okay. and uh, at about eight yards, and he just read what was happening. Is and it almost like one match? Was it almost like cover like match out of yes. one a little bit? Okay, all right, it's that's exactly what okay. It was. So awesome. it was a it was a it was a man to man coverage. Everybody had outside leverage. You could give up the inside yep. route because yep. my, the expectation was I would be there to help you. Exactly, on the route. and you have to be. And that's that's the biggest thing. I used to tell our guys all the time, and I've said this before. You know. God, I always want you to, to be in the right coverage and I always want you to get the call, but God forbid you don't, you know, even if we're all wrong, running the same coverage, we'll be all right. Just don't run that's, half that's a coverage right. here. Another one. If we're all wrong, we're all right. So again, every that, DB is, it's amazing how much more that happens than people think. I, I agree with you. And, and the other thing is that, you know, just because you see a guy get beat on the inside or the, I mean, it not, it's not always how it looks on TV. Yeah. You know, it was, a lot of times somebody was supposed to help that guy that never showed up. Exactly. For instance, when when Tennessee threw the long touchdown pass to put them up in the in the SEC championship game in 1997, our cornerback on that side of the ball, who who was in front of Marcus Nash when he caught that little five yard hitch pass, mm-hmm. he had a broken left arm that huh. nobody knew about. We didn't know about it, but he had intercepted a pass. Jason Bray earlier in that game had made an unbelievable return, had gotten tackled around midfield and broke his left arm, God. and he he tried to play through it. So in on that play, if you go back and look at it. When 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 he catches that pass and Jason comes up to uh, to, to make the tackle, I'm inside out running it, and, and we have him double covered. Yeah. So any inside any inside route is is me. Anything down the field or out is Jason. Well, it's a stop. Well, as Jason comes up to make the tackle and breaks down, I'm expecting him to funnel him to me, but instead he gets on 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 the sideline on Jason's left arm, and he can't extend his left arm. God. And so now my angle is poor because I think that he's going to be funneled to me or Jason's yep, going to use yep. the Because you've seen it a million spread. times. You've done it a million times with that same and, guy. And 73 yards later, we lose yeah. the SEC championship game by point, and And nobody's probably ever heard that story um, because you just don't hear about those kind of things. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it, there's always a story behind the story of some of these, uh, some of these plays. Exactly, man. I, I appreciate you sharing that. Obviously I didn't know that. And I'm sure we probably have some listeners in our audience going, Oh my God, that makes a lot of sense. Cause I'm sure they're probably there. And, and again, you guys, you know, to get there, you guys have made that play a, a million times, but you know, Rob can kind of speaking in, in that vein a little bit. Can you kind of tell me your best memory uh, on the field as an Auburn player? What, what What's the one thing that even today, you know, before you close your eyes at night, you know, sometimes you see flashes of, of that memory? Uh, I think uh, going into Tuscaloosa and uh, beating Alabama, uh, being the first team to make that trek um, in over 100 years, um, the way that day unfolded and, and finding out that uh, um, that if we won, we were going to represent the West and go back to Atlanta having endured um, a coaching change, two consecutive losing seasons, being picked 55th in the country, wow. um, and last in the SEC, um, nobody gave us a chance. And um, and to walk into that stadium after they were preseason number three in the country and to shut them out, um, I had an interception on the uh, first drive of the game. Um, you know, and, and just, I grew up in Birmingham. You know, yeah. I grew up around this game. You know, I... I um, had envisioned and been told I would play in this game my whole life. And, uh, you know, but I had grown up an Alabama fan. And so mm-hmm. I'd always seen this from the other, from the other viewpoint. And so, you know, 
if, if I went back and, and thought about the very first time I played those guys in Jordan Hare, um, where we kicked the field goal with Jarrett Holmes and, and we went on to the SEC championship game, I can vividly remember just standing on the sidelines and hearing War Eagle and, and you know, looking across the at, at those guys and, and, and just tearing up, you know, just, yeah. I mean, literally in tears before the kickoff because I'm ready to run through a brick wall because I'm finally here. And, and yeah. I recognize all the people that came before me that made this game great. And, and I'm just grateful to be, you know, able to, to carry on in that, uh, that vein. But, uh, but going over there and, and beating those guys and, and doing it with the guys that uh, had been through so much. And uh, I mean, it was special. Yeah. You know, and it's crazy. My, my dad used to tell me all the time, cause I'd ask him, you know, what was it like, you know, whether before the game or whatever, when, you know, you'd look at him, because my dad was always one of those guys, he was going to look at you. He wanted, you know, he wanted you to know he was looking at you. And he used to tell me that every time he'd look into their eyes, he saw what he wanted and he was going to take it. And to me, that that says it all, you know what I'm saying? And and just, you know, and again, I, I know I, I don't want to get too deep or, or you know, uh, psychological, but can you just talk about, you know, what it does to you as a person physically – you know, when you're playing that game, I mean, you almost feel nothing. I mean, it's, you know, you know, pain wise. And can you just talk about the adrenaline and just how it makes you do things that even you yourself didn't think you could do? Well, it's a it's an emotional game. And, um, you know, we talk about just you, you think about COVID and, and how not being able to fill stadiums. Um, if that is indeed what happens when college football kicks off this year and the impact that will have on the home team. I can't even explain to you how big that is because it is super impactful. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I don't think there's a such thing as an emotionless, um, football player. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of like there's no such thing as an atheist on a battlefield. Mm -hmm. Um, guys carry it differently. Um, guys respond differently, but everybody's blood is pumping and, and everybody is willing to do whatever it takes. Um, you know, to, 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 to battle for their brother beside them. Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, I think that I, in, in a lot of ways I tried that I almost, I had the burden of having to get everybody lined up. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, yeah, uh, so we're so focused on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it's the, it's the getting the call from the sideline. It's yeah. the communicating that call to, to the guys that you're back there with. It's the questions. If they come out in this, formation what are we going to check to yeah it's you know it's all that and so and so i was so focused on that that a lot of times all the other noise was, was kind of drowned out but um um you know even even at that i think most people would tell you that i'm a pretty reserved guy yeah pretty mild mannered but um but you, you're a different person on the football field i mean yeah. and you have to be i mean you have to be to protect yourself you have to be to be able to match the uh, the intensity that the other people are playing with and if you just don't come with that level, then uh, you're just not going to last. And it's a it's a different animal at this uh, at this stage of, of, of football in the SEC. Definitely. And 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 kind of last thing ta talking about when you were playing. And and again, I I love to get our audience on the field. I want them to understand kind of what it's like. Can you explain since you were a guy that had to get people lined up, especially playing in stadiums where you can't hear the guy next to you, just how difficult it is and how much practice it does take being able to not only get the call, see the formation, get into the right check if you have to, but be able to adjust pre-play when they adjust. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, and it's, it's dependent upon what kind of defense you run. And, you know, we ran a lot of zone when, uh, when coach Oliver was here. And so in order to be a good zone team, you've got to match up well. Yes. And, um, and so there were a lot of checks. In fact, we called two plays in the huddle every time we called a defense. Okay. And they would have they would have a front, and we would match it with a uh, uh, with a secondary call, a perimeter call. But yep. but if they came out in certain formations, it was going to go to another one. We yep. went ahead and said what that was, so everybody was on the same page. But you had to have hand signals. You know, you can't operate. The the neat thing about being a defender is that when you step into an opposing team stadium. They're not loud when you're on. Yeah, the that is so that you is don't an have advantage. To contend with that. Yeah. So you're you're contending with your own stadium, with your own people that, that are friends. And, and, and but but that's a joke. I mean that you never see defenders say, "Hey, be quiet," so we can get our signal. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. you want you want the ruckus and you want the chaos and you want the crowd in there helping you because they truly are that twelfth man. Yeah. And you know we're on the same page. We 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 know what we're going to do together. Please make it impossible for that left tackle to hear. 
uh, the quarterback's cadence because if Marcus Washington or or you know any one of our defensive ends get in there and, and create havoc, then it's going to make us look a lot better. We're not going to have to hold our position as long as we would mm-hmm. um, because there's just poor communication. So uh, the crowd noise is a real thing, and and I don't know that there's a fan base that does it better than Auburn, and uh, and and that's known throughout college football. I mean, we had coaches. Coach Oliver used to tell us, you know, if there's one place that, that was hell to play, it was right here. Yeah, it was, it was, it was in Jordan here. Coach Tuberville would come over, you know, there's a place we, it was right here, you know. Yeah. So they knew that that place could come to life and be ungodly. And as a defender, it was, it was your greatest asset, and uh, and, and that's lived on for a lot of Auburn defenses. That, that that's a great point, and 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 again, just the communication part, like like you said, it's just it's such a big deal, and and being able to have an advantage at home is is that's the exact truth. Now, kind of moving on to where Auburn is now, um, I really just you know kind of want your opinion on on what what you think Auburn's going to do this season, and really what you're looking for them to improve on, you know, coming off of last year. Well, I, you know, I think that uh, obviously you've got a ton to replace uh, on both lines of scrimmages. Um, you know, the offensive line, I think, is what uh, concerns me the most. And, and not because we don't have capable guys, but just because we don't have the, the benefit of a spring training. Yeah. You have a new coach and you have an offensive, new offensive coordinator yeah. that have to all gel together. So, you know, I, I think because of that, that, that we'll probably see an offense that comes out and they will do more throwing to set up the run mm-hmm. as opposed to to what we would traditionally see trying to run the ball first because you've got the horses to do it and you've yeah. got a quarterback that you trust that uh, to deliver the ball to make wise decisions to do that. And, and, and then you'll see a lot of RPOs off of that and, and giving the opportunity for Bo to diagnose and, and make a play with uh, the athletic ability he has, but with his head as well. Yeah. Um, I'm not as concerned about, uh, you know, about defensively, even though, I mean, you, you, you're likely going to take a step back in production when you lose somebody as dominant as uh, what Derek Brown was. Yeah. I, I don't know that I've ever seen a person as disruptive as he was last year. Um, so, you know, to try to fill his shoes, um, I think that's an impossibility. But again, I think that there's plenty of guys up front to be able to carry the load. Um, to be able to uh, um, to do what it takes to be successful, and, and Kevin Steele has been around long enough to to put guys in position to be uh, uh, to be great playmakers, and and the linebacking core will make them look better. You know, yeah. but the, the the linebackers benefited immensely from what from what they had in front of them, and this next year it's going to be their job, you know, to, uh, to to take some of the onus off of what those guys are having to do up front. But we've got some space eaters up there. We've got some guys that. Uh, uh, like Daquan Newkirk. I mean, if you if you go to a practice and you stand next to that guy, oh, he he's a freak. Like a tank. I mean, it is unbelievable how big he is and and how strong he is. And you know, he he's had to deal with so many uh, injuries that yeah. uh, I don't think we've gotten a good taste of of what he's capable of. So his health, I think, is a is a uh, is a big factor. A, a guy like Connor uh, Miller is mm-hmm. going to have to grow up. He's going to have to. Yeah, and, yep. mean, he's going to have to uh, fill that role and. Uh, you know, if those guys can come along, I think that uh, we'll be solid everywhere else. I agree, and I think Connus has as much talent as anybody if, if he'll just, you know, kind of get his head out of his you-know-what a little bit. But, you know, at the end of the day, it, once they turn it on, you know as well as I do, once they figure it out, they figure it out. So hopefully he does. You know, everybody's rooting for him. But uh, and, and, and he's got and he's got no better coach oh my to God. get the most out of him. You know? Without so, a and, doubt. And, and, yeah, so I, I fully expect that he'll turn the corner and, and he'll have a, uh, a big, big season from a productivity standpoint. Definitely. And, and and last question while I got you on here, Rob, and again, man, I really appreciate you coming on. Can you just talk about uh, how important it is and how much of a luxury it is for Auburn to have a quarterback returning, you know, obviously the caliber of Bo Nix, but a guy that, you know, pro- has proven himself as a team leader. And even when you go through something like this coronavirus, even though, you know, we've really never been through it, just how much of a feather in the cap having a guy that doesn't need to relearn how to lead is once everybody gets back. I don't think there's anything that, that's more important um, in the entire chemistry and makeup of, of the success of a football team. I mean, it's in this day and age, um, you know, the quarterback play dictates almost to a T how successful a team's going to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you, everybody still wants to run the football. Everybody still wants to be dominant in the trenches. But it's really hard to be an elite team and not have elite quarterback play. Exactly. And right. I think I think he gives you um, the opportunity to do that. And um you know, he, he's got all the intangibles. He, he's a kid that uh, is, is confident in his abilities. 
he, he's cocky enough to where, um, you know, you want to follow him and you know that, uh, uh, that he can do what he says he can do and what he thinks he can do, but he's not so cocky that, uh, that you don't want to go out there and, and, and battle behind him. I mean, he, he's just, he, he has just the right mix of that. And so, yeah. um, I, I think it's so important that, uh, um, that, that they have that and, uh, that, that he's able to come out and, uh, um, they give him a, a lot to work with. They don't, they don't make it so that he's constantly having to play from behind the sticks that they, uh, that they let him throw on first down, throw on, you know, let, let him, let him, let him lead the football team. Don't make yeah. him play from behind the entire time. And uh, I think if we can do that, then, uh, then we'll start moving in a positive direction, but, uh, he's a, he's a great player. And I, I don't, I'm, I've been on his on his side, you know, from from day one. I have too. <laughs> as far as the caliber of kid he yeah. is, what he's uh, what I think he's able to contribute, and uh, I think that he hasn't even scratched the surface of, of what's uh, possible for him in his future. Uh, I agree, Rob. I think that's spot on, man. And and uh, you know, before I let you go, I, I know you're on a lot of shows, man. You do a really good job. Uh, you're very well heard. Where can people find you other, other than this podcast? Well, I go on with one of my teammates uh, on uh, WJOX every mm-hmm. Thursday at noon and uh, do a do a 15-minute Auburn uh, uh, interview. And then uh, uh, during the season, I'll write a, uh, a game preview and a game review for the 24-7 uh, Auburn site, uh, auburnundercover.com. And, mm-hmm. um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, I'm uh, – uh, I'm not very active on Twitter. I used to be, but I've yeah. got a bunch of uh, I got a bunch of kids. And, there you go. And uh, <laughs> just not on there. Yeah, I don't uh, yet, but I'm sure uh, t- I'm not going to be as popping on Twitter once that once that happens. So uh, <laughs> no, you will not. <laughs> well, Rob, man, I I really appreciate it, brother, and I'm I would love to have you on again, especially as we get closer to the football season. And uh, you know, again, dude, it's, uh, I appreciate the stories, and our audience is going to love this one, and I really appreciate it, man. Well, War Eagle to uh, to all of your listeners, and uh, congratulations to you on uh, just doing a great job, and uh, I look forward to hearing more from you. Oh, well, Rob, I appreciate that coming from you. That means a lot, man. And again, we'll talk soon. And uh, again, everybody, I thank you guys for listening. Uh, that's Rob Pate, one of the best. Uh, this has been another episode of J-Boy with Rob Pate, and J-Boy is out. <laughs>